uh, who was married to a Tarboro uh, guy, Randy Raskin. And so I've heard about Tarboro for many years, and it's been a joy to get to know um, the place where Randy grew up. Um, I bring you greetings from Columbia Seminary, where I teach theology, and one of our proudest claims to fame is that we gave a demon to your pastor, uh, Ben King. Um, uh, and uh, Columbia, as with Union Seminary, which is where I graduated from seminary, continues to be a place where we uh, draw people from across the country, and increasingly from other parts of the world as well, to form and shape folks um, for leadership in the church. Um, it's a great place to be, and I encourage all of you, if you're ever in the Atlantic area, to come by and visit, see our campus, take advantage of our library and our resources, and come say hi to me. Um, we welcome you there. So, with thanks for all of these things, let's turn now to the New Testament reading for today, which is from uh, the Gospel according to Mark, and you've already heard a little bit of this this morning. But hear this word now from chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. Messiah. And he charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. <laughs> and he called to him the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this morning, even though it is the first Sunday of Lent, even so, I suspect all of us came to church today expecting to hear good news. I suspect we came here Settled comfortably into our seats, ready to hear the word. We're ready and joyful and expectant. And then Jesus comes along and ruins it. Where do you listen? He's walking along with his disciples one day, and sun glinting off of the sand on the roads and dancing on the blue green water in the distance. The disciples have been traveling with him for a while now, watching Jesus heal and teach and feed the multitudes, shake up the religious authorities. It's been exciting, and for the most part, it's been deeply life-giving. And so, as they walk, he asks them, who do people say that I am? And they say, John the Baptist, or maybe Elijah, or maybe one of the prophets. He presses them further and says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, blessed, impetuous Peter, blurts out, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, come into the world to bring in the kingdom of God. It sounds like good news. You would think 
that maybe Jesus would congratulate Peter on being so perceptive. But, you know, no such words of praise for Peter. Instead, in a few short verses, Jesus scandalizes his disciples with three pieces of bad news. First, don't tell anyone about me. Second, he says, I'm going to suffer and be killed. And third, anybody who wants to follow me needs to deny yourselves and take up the cross and lose your life. Silence, death, self-denial. After such news, it's a wonder that any of us are still here this morning. It's a wonder that anybody shows up to church, let alone to seminary. Look at you. <laughs> when Peter declares you are the Messiah or the Christ, it's the same word, right? Messiah is the Hebrew, Christ is the Greek, it's the same word. When Peter says that, you are the Messiah or you are the Christ, he likely had in mind a political liberator who was going to free the people of Israel from tyranny. After all, if you think about it, first century. Palestine under Roman rule, the people of Israel had been living under foreign authorities, under Roman occupation for some time now, and after many attempts at rebellion, they were still being dominated by these foreign rulers. So to call Jesus Messiah, to name him as Christ, would have tapped into the hopes of the people for someone who would bring that Roman rule to an end, inaugurate a new era of political sovereignty under the leadership of the true king, the heir of King David, make Israel great again. But as soon as Peter identifies him as Messiah, Jesus forbids him to talk about it. And he begins to describe his own suffering and death that lies ahead. In other words, he seems to be saying to Peter, this word, Christ, this word does not mean what you think it means. It's not a title of triumphant power. It's a name that means suffering, rejection, and public execution. Jesus, you see, has been reading the book of Isaiah that we heard also, this morning, Jesus knows what it means to be truly anointed. It means to receive rebuke, retribution, even death. Some of you in this room may remember the early 1970s. Can I get a show of hands? Never mind. Uh, if you lived through the early 1970s, or even since that time, you may know the musical Jesus Christ Superstar. Maybe I can get a show of hands on that one. Jesus Christ Superstar, all right. Andrew Lloyd Webber's early hit in London and on Broadway, which caused quite a stir when it first came out. When I was growing up, we had the double album. That was vinyl. That was back when we had vinyl. And we often played the soundtrack in the living room. Uh, my older brother used to send me out of the room with the shivers when he played the spooky, spooky overture. But in that show, you may remember, there is a memorable scene of Jesus' confrontation with Herod, in which the Roman ruler echoes this triumphant understanding of the word Christ. This is what Peter probably had in mind. Herod sings, So you are the Christ, you're the great Jesus Christ. Prove to me that you're divine, change my water into wine. It's all you need do, and I'll know it's all true. He sings, Come on, King of the Jews. And he goes on a little bit later, he says, So if you are the Christ, you're the great Jesus Christ. Prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool. If you do that for me, then I'll let you go free. Come on, king of the Jews. But Jesus 
refuses Herod, just as he rebukes Peter in this story from Mark today. Christ does not mean superstar. It does not mean awesome, heroic general at the head of God's army. Messiah, the one anointed to save God's people, saves not by standing at the head of a mighty military power, but by going to the back of the line to join the least of these. Some of you may know the name of Jean Vanier. He's a French-Canadian philosopher who died a few years ago, but in 1964, he moved into a dilapidated house in a small village in France with two companions who had intellectual disabilities. His move began a movement, now an international movement, called L'Arche, that is French for the Ark, as in Noah's Ark, the Ark, L'Arche. And L'Arche communities now, around the world, bring together adults with developmental disabilities as well as adults who do not have such disabilities to live in close community. It is a messy, human, beautiful, inspiring movement. Some of you may also know that this past week brought some hard news about Vanier's own life. Revelations of his own misuse of power, his own moral failings. And in light of these things, it's difficult for those of us who have known his writings for a long time to hold on to the truth of what he said, even as we also wrestle with what we now know to be the truth of his life. But I say this because there's a story that he tells that relates directly to Jesus' teaching for today, and it's that story that I want you to hear. Vanier says uh, that there was once a young man with a disability who was competing in the Special Olympics. He was competing in the 100-meter race, and he was running like crazy to get that gold medal. But as he was running, one of the other competitors running with him slipped and fell. And the young man turned around and picked him up. And they crossed the finish line together, last. Vanier asks, are we prepared to sacrifice the prize for the sake of solidarity? Do we want to win? Or do we want to be in solidarity with others? This story makes me think this is the way of the Messiah, not the hero alone who wins the race. It's the one who turns back, who bends down, who takes up the cross and sacrifices his life for others, who loses his life so that all may rise. Now, Peter was scandalized when Jesus told him that he was going to suffer and be rejected and killed. So Peter took him aside and rebuked him, saying, Surely not, Lord. Go lead a rebellion. Change the water into wine. Walk across the swimming pool. Don't you love us, Lord? We need your help. Won't you rescue us from this veil of tears? But Jesus rebukes him right back. Jesus says, do you know what love is, Peter? It's not entering into human power schemes of tyranny and defeat, into the grim logic that requires winners and losers, the cynical calculus of acceptable losses, collateral damage. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected and killed and after three days, rise again. And so we might ask, why? Why must the Messiah suffer so? And it's because he is not in the business of slaughtering his enemies. He's in the business of loving them. And so we ask, what does this mean for us? What does it mean for us? to take up our cross and follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow the sacrificial way of love that Jesus lived? 
There is a danger here, and it's important to acknowledge. We could hear this simply as a call to embrace suffering. Too many faithful Christians in the world have taught that the way of love means submitting to abuse at the hands of others because it's simply our cross to bear. So hear me say this, and very clearly, Jesus comes to bring life, not terror and pain. He does not call anyone to stay in an abusive relationship of any kind. And if you are in such a relationship, talk to somebody you trust and get out now. So Jesus is not saying, if anyone wants to follow me, you need to submit to abuse. That's not what he's saying. He says, if any want to become followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The point of this is life. But it's not a privatized life tightly grasped and defended as our own. I think it's an important word for us today. It's an important word for us, perhaps, especially as we think about our beloved church, the Presbyterian Church, the denomination which is indeed losing numbers and power and prestige in the world. We might be anxious about this. We might decide to be afraid about such loss of numbers, but I think Precisely to us, Jesus has a word. The way of Jesus requires us to give up our lives, to give up our power and prestige, our treasured, comfortable way of doing things for the sake of something that is yet unseen coming into being in the world. Jean Vanier, in another one of his writings, reflects on what happened right after 9-11. He remembers this. He says, right after September 11th, people from various cultures and religions, as well as people with no specific religious tradition, came together to pray and to affirm together their vision of mutual acceptance and their esteem and love for all human beings. And such prayer is good. But he says, these evenings of prayer sometimes left me a bit uneasy. I felt as though people were not praying for a new just order between people and nations, but motivated by fear, were praying to keep the status quo. No change, no insecurity, nothing that would disturb their lives or views on the world. I wonder... I wonder if we do the same thing sometimes. Do we pray to save our lives, to preserve our way of living? Jesus challenges us in this passage not to focus on saving our lives, but to lose our lives for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the gospel. I wonder what this means for us. Maybe it means giving up our fierce attachment to our own way of life, our own possessions, our own point of view, perhaps, seeking to see others with the eyes of Christ. A final story to help us think about these things, and this one not from the gospel, but from a children's book called Zen Shorts by John Muth. The story is called Uncle Rye and the Moon, and here it is. I wish you could see the pictures, but I'll just have to read you this text. My Uncle Rye lived alone in a small house up in the hills. He didn't own many things. He lived a simple life. One evening, he discovered he had a visitor. A robber had broken into the house and was rummaging through my uncle's few belongings. The robber didn't notice Uncle Rye, and when my uncle said hello, the robber was so startled that he almost fell down. 
My uncle smiled at the robber and shook his hand. Welcome, welcome, how nice of you to visit. The robber opened his mouth to speak, but he couldn't think of anything to say. Because Rye never lets anyone leave empty-handed, he looked around the tiny hut for a gift for the robber, but there was nothing to give. The robber began to back toward the door. He wanted to leave, and at last, Uncle Rye knew what to do. He took off his only robe, which was old and tattered. Here, he said, take this. The robber thought my uncle was crazy. He took the robe, dashed out the door, and escaped into the night. And my uncle sat and looked at the moon, its silvery light spilling over the mountains, making all things quietly beautiful. Poor man, lamented my uncle. All I had to give him was my tattered robe. If only I could have given him this wonderful moon. Those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Uncle Rye in this story knows nothing of Jesus, but he seems to have some of this same wisdom. Life, abundant life, does not come from fiercely defending our goods, our perspectives, our way of life, even our church, but from free and sacrificial love from giving away one's only robe and wishing we could also give the moon. This is the message that we hear from Jesus today. Jesus calls us to follow him in the way of the cross, which is the way of love, to lose our own lives so that we, and perhaps all, may be saved. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Friends, this is Christ. This is not Howard Memorial's table. This is not a Presbyterian table, but this is the Lord's table. And it is the Lord who invites all of us to come to taste a foretaste of the kingdom of heaven. You come who have been here often and you who have not been here in a long time. You with much faith and you with little come. The Lord wishes to sit with you to share the bread and the cup with you. The Lord wishes for all of us to find our space at this table. Come, the Lord invites all of us. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right Holy One, in this dry and weary land, we give you thanks and praise. You provide for us in our need. You set a table for us in the wilderness. Even when we despair and complain against you, you feed us with bread from heaven. Even when we quarrel and question your grace, you give us water from a stone. How we keep silent. Even dry bones in the valley of death stand to sing your praise. And so we give you thanks and praise for Jesus, our way in the wilderness, our companion in the desert. He knows our hunger and thirst. He gives us the bread of life to eat and lift water to drink. He leads us beside still water and prepares this table for us. Even in the presence of our enemies, the cup of blessing overflows. And now, God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon this bread, upon this cup, upon this dry and weary land. By the power of your Spirit, breathe light into our dust and hope into our bones. As we receive this bread and cup, make us one flesh and one blood, one in the body of Christ. Let us live to sing your praise and show your love to all until our wilderness wandering is over and we feast with you forever in the land that you have promised each of us. We lift all of these prayers, prayers to you for who you have been, 
who you are and who you will continue to be for us and in our lives. We also lift up all the prayers that we have said silently in our own hearts this day. Knowing that you hear all and you are with all. We pray all of this through Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, knowing that all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, gathered at table with his disciples, and he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is a new covenant. It is sealed in my blood, and it is shed for your sins, and for all the sins the world has known, and all the sins the world will ever know. Each time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of you. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. We will draw near and receive them with joy and thanksgiving. We are going to celebrate communion by intention. In just a second, I'm going to pull the table back. And Martha and I are going to serve the entire congregation. We are going to invite you to come. We'll start on this side and go every other pew and to come forward to receive the bread and to dip it into the cup and then to head back to your pew on the side aisles. If you cannot come forward for whatever reason, we will bring the cup and the bread to you. Let us taste a foretaste of the kingdom. 